This is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome to the Seminole Wars Authority. When you see someone portraying a Seminole in a battle reenactment today, you can pretty much rest assured that the attire is authentic, if not original. This was not the case 30 to 40 years ago. Many reenactors had good intentions, but they simply got the clothing wrong. Enter then para accountant and Seminole reenactor Rick Obermeyer. Rick took both an interest and began a campaign to portray 19th century Seminole men's clothing as accurately as feasible. He published his book by that name in 1991. It has served as a handbook for Seminole reenactors ever since. Rick had no special academic training for this task. College graduate though he was, his specialty was not Seminole Wars history. What he did have is a passionate desire to portray Seminole warriors as they presented themselves back then. Listen now as he details just how he assembled that knowledge into a simple manual of instruction. Rick Obermeyer. Welcome to the Seminole Wars Authority. Yes, thank you. Okay, Rick. Your book is 19th Century Seminole Men's Clothing. A very specific topic, but there's a lot to it. How did participating in living history events that featured the Seminoles provide an impetus for putting together a book like this, which is all but an instruction manual for obtaining authenticity in the Seminole attire that one wears for such events? Let me start out by saying that when I started going to reenactments, I was going with a variety of friends. Some were friends from scouting, older scouts and adults. And we noticed that there were people out there full of enthusiasm, full of sincerity, but somewhat lacking in historical accuracy. It became apparent that there were broadly two kinds of reenactors. Those doing it who were doing basically cowboys and Indians for grown-ups, and those doing it for a taste of history. And then those are further divided into, uh, let me call blue-collar and readers. The blue-collar types were interested in doing it right, but they weren't all that interested in doing reading and research. They went by pictures or gut feelings or what somebody else told them. Those of us who are readers, notice I'm carefully avoid saying educated, readers, we were interested in finding out well, that's well and good, but how do we know what really happened? For example, we're pretty sure that an 1840 Seminole would not be wearing Apache boots or a 20th century ribbon shirt or a Plains bone choker to have his face painted black and white like Skeletor. But we had no way of saying, you know, guys, are you sure that's right? Because if we said that, they'll say, oh, I saw a great Aunt Moomy said it was a way to do it. <clears throat> and you're not going to call her a liar, are you? And we say, well, uh, no. Seems to me there's no question this book needed to be published. Still, for the record, why did you edit this volume? Why did I edit a book on the subject? Because, like I said, I had a variety of friends, and my friends had a variety of specialties. So it was simply a matter of going to this friend or that friend and saying, Hey, I know you're really into bandolier bags. Could you develop an article for me? I knew somebody who was very proud of being a, himself a Quarter Creek, and he had done a very careful research paper on a simple plain shirt and was developing research on the long shirt. Long shirt, big shirt, what's the difference? I had to find that out. It may be true that no one person has all the knowledge for all the elements of seminal attire contained in your book. So you reached out to fellow craftsmen in the reenacting community and asked them to pen chapters. Tell us about that. I worked for a printing company, and I had printing experience. I was editor of a magazine at FSU, and I had done some local scout histories. So I was challenged. And if this person or that person would write something on what they had individually been interested in, it was a simple matter of just putting the chapters together and filling a few gaps here and there, and the gaps were not significant. So the chapters were just a matter of what are the parts of a Seminole man's outfit, like what are the parts of a Model T? Well, there's the engine and the wheels and the steering wheel and the seats. What are the parts of a man's outfit? Well, there's the shoes and the leggings and plain shirt and the long shirt. 
So we just looked at the parts and then looked for articles to go with the parts. Before you started this, what type of material was available in the public domain? I'll put it this way. When I very, very first got into it, even before I started going to Ray Agnes, I went to the library, Orlando Public. They had a book on piece metals. They had a three-page pamphlet on some metal patchwork. That was it. How did you work with bibliographies? Bibliographies, I see a reference at the end of an article, and next time I was in games, I would look up that reference. And then the next time, when I found that reference, it would give me more references. Yeah, our books on seminal patchwork started appearing in uh, stores that Katie were too lazy to do quilting. And they described the patchwork technique very well. They left out a lot of details on the seminal way of doing it. So, unlike French cooking, no, there was no one person who knew all of it. And I met this gentleman later, Billy Osceola O'Toole. When I met him, he was in his 60s or 70s. He came to a historic day someplace, and he was dressed impeccably accurately. So presumably, he already knew anything. Only problem is, I didn't already know him. It's comforting when we did put the book together in as much detail as we thought we had access to, and then looked at what he looked like, we looked at him and said, oh, so he did it right after all. And that was a comforting feeling. He just showed up. I can tell you a story about Billy O'Toole there were boys down in Sarasota and Naples doing accurate Seminole reenactment for their scout ceremonies. There's something in scouting called the War of the Arrow, and they have ceremonies. And National, for a while now, has included local groups to follow local customs and traditions so they wouldn't all be cookie-cutter Plains Indian feather by a buckskins. Apparently, there was something done in Naples, like historic days. Some old ladies were there with their tables and their souvenirs, their, their wooden knives, their little dolls. And they saw these white boys running around dressed as Seminoles. And they didn't all approve of it. And Billy O'Toole said to them, no, no, you leave those white boys alone. Someday our boys will go to those boys to find out how to do it. That's a curious statement. What do you think he meant by that? When I first got into this, sometimes I get calls from schools saying they would like for a Seminole to come to school and talk about being a Seminole and wear their traditional outfit. And I say, well, that sounds pretty nice. But traditional Seminoles don't know about where 100 years ago. I'm German. What do I know about later hosen and thistle caps? Your better bet is to go to somebody who knows what they're talking about, even if it's a white researcher. Now, later on, I've met Seminoles who benefited from the research we did, and they showed up. They would show up and dress accurately, which, again, was reassuring. I got to talk with one of them, a gentleman in his 20s, about some of those in their heritage. He said, well, you get to a certain age. He had two brothers. You get to a certain age, and you decide if you're going to go white or if you're going to go Seminole. And he decided to go Seminole. Interesting. So the people I asked to write chapters were people, white people, who had developed an interest in some aspect of the outfitting except Pete Thompson, who was a quarter creek and was researching what he felt was his own cultural heritage. Who was your intended audience for this book? I uh, see. The audience was Boy Scouts looking how to do Florida Native Americans accurately, some of the war reenactors. So those would show up wearing simplified costumes, and we get asked, how do you do that? How do you do that? And we get asked the same question over and over again. And they were good questions, because they were questions we had asked ourselves. So it started with a plain shirt. Pete had generated a simple pamphlet, multiple copies of that pamphlet, and somebody asked a question. We said, here, read it. And they were glad to have access to the information, and we were glad not to have to answer a very good question the only of the time. The workbook was the first in its field. It was a small ripple in a small pond. But I'm pleased that in the time that we've done it, I've only had to correct a couple minor mistakes. All in all, I'm pleased to stand by it. Something else, the workbook was not research and library. I have a very good friend who moved to Connecticut. Sometimes he comes to Florida, we go camping. Sometimes I go up there and we go camping. Sometimes we get in the car and go camping between here and there, visiting museums along the way. So that's how I was able to look at a lot of Southeastern artifacts in museums. Contacted American Museum of Natural History and said, I'd like to look at what they had. And I early on realized that if you contact the curator of a museum 
and tell them, you want to look at some neat stuff, uh, they're not interested. But if you tell them, I like to look, if you have any, I like to look at big shirts and plain shirts and moccasins. And if you're real specific on what you want to look at, they get real interested in helping you research specific information. When I was at the Museum of Natural History, they store things in huge flat drawers. So the drawers like three by five feet and only three inches deep. And you fill out the drawer and there is everything laid out flat. So while she's doing busy work in the corner, she let me pull out the drawers, take them to a table, and then get up and stand on the table so I could take pictures of everything in the drawer. She said, technically, I shouldn't be allowing you this because you're not an academic, but I know that anything you find out, you will share with a lot of people. So that's why she was very cooperative. We uh, sit around and talk about, well, what colors did they use? After all, this is the early 19th century. We assumed they didn't have a lot of variety of colors. It was going to have to be a lot of solid colors. And then somebody went to a museum in Germany. In that museum were a couple of long shirts that had been collected by part of a diplomatic party from Germany just after 1840. And these things were violent. We're looking at paisleys. We're looking at floral prints. We're saying, wow, they had a lot more color than we knew about. And why do we have that? Because somebody who was interested in Seminole clothing had a friend who knew of his interest in Seminole clothing. And when he was at, when they were at the museum, they took pictures for us. And then when we got the pictures, we had a newsletter at the time. It fit the budget of our newsletter to make color copies of the photographs and put them in the newsletter. So everybody was to say, wow, look how violent I can get in my colors. When I went to London, I went to the British Museum and they have a few items on display collected in the 1820s. Very interesting. And that was fun because European museums aren't as well funded as American museums are. So the whole museum is not open at the same time. Like the Roman section is open till noon, till lunch, and then it's open after lunch and then something else is closed. The little section with the seminal stuff was closed in the morning and open in the afternoon. Somebody who went there a couple of years later said, well, that stuff's not on display anymore. They've rotated it out. Ooh. But we got pictures of it because we went and we looked. What are the problems that you found looking in these museums when it comes to seminal attire and artifacts? There's a problem. There's the American Museum of Natural History in New York. There's the Denver Museum that has some seminal stuff misidentified as Cherokee. But all that stuff is from 1890 or later. If you want something from the 1840s, that's in only one place. A Seminole soldier in the Second War apparently had put together some Seminole stuff, just a few items of clothing, and took them home with him to New York. They wound up in a Canadian museum. Later on, the Canadian museum made a trade with our Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. So they got it. They displayed it on a mannequin very nicely in a case. They got plenty of bright sunlight. Ah. But that's the only pre-1880 Seminoles clothing that I know of. There's plenty of other stuff. There's an occasional older bandolier bag. I've seen bandolier bags from the 1850s, 1860s. But in terms of clothing, it didn't last. They'd bury the Seminole in it or it would wear out or it would turn into rags and they use it for something else. Original artifacts just aren't there because they got it in the 1820s and they kept it. It's like if you go to a certain Russian museum in St. Petersburg, you can see a stuffed dodo. They've had a stuffed dodo ever since dodos were available to be had. Rick, what's your background? Do you have Native American blood in your veins? I'm told I'm one 132nd Native American because my great-grandmother's mother was said to be a half-breed herb woman in Oklahoma. It's unfortunate so much of this has been lost. People had no reason to archive Seminole clothing. At the Seminole Museum in Oklahoma, there is a Seminole big shirt, but it was made after the removal, and it has strange details, let me put it that way. Generally speaking, instead of being horizontal, it was vertical. And it was on display, but they had no idea, within accuracy, what year it was generated. It's as if they came across something old and decided to put it on display. Except in Pete's case, the guy with the bandolier bag, he would go digging for pictures of bandolier bags and figure out how they were put together. 
he read about the two needle method of beadwork and practiced that until he figured out how it worked. The guy who wrote the section on gorgeous, he got out some metal and started hammering and figured out how that was made by doing it. The Seminoles would make their gorges, the leader Seminoles, they put an axe in a log and use the butt end of the axe for an anvil. Then they take silver dimes and quarters and hammer the dimes and quarters together to get the gorget that they wanted. We'd read about that, and then we might try it to see how it worked. This sounds like that expression, experimental archaeology. Kind of, kind of. But the worst, the very worst, when you say archaeology, guys who wore pre-contact ornaments, shell with designs cut into them, like we say, well, how did they get that? Oh, they could have gone burrowing through the burial mounds to look for jewelry. No! Native Americans don't go digging up their ancestors looking for jewelry. So when you see somebody wearing something like that, that's very well made, very hard to make, but it's like one or two hundred years out of step. You don't say, man, why are you wearing stuff that was looted from a grave? No, you don't say that. You just smile and walk away. So how did you or your fellow craftsmen be able to determine what right looks like? What you do is, is you make an article of clothing and then compare that to something you've seen in a museum, you can be satisfied that your article is fairly close to what you have a photograph of. For example, imagine that a cape might have a ruffle. Now, a white person would take in hand the, the edge of the ruffle, so it didn't get frayed. No, there's an 1840 outfit I told you about. It's in the Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. And a student went there and did a paper on it, studied it closely. And he looked at their ruffles, and he could tell that somebody took a needle and plucked the threads from the edge of those ruffles to give them a fuzzy, furry look. How amazing. And we know that only because one person with a specific interest went and looked at the single known extant piece. Those of us who are readers cut some slack with the enthusiastic types because what they're looking for just isn't there. I wondered about that. Couldn't they just go to a library to find this information? Could somebody go to a library? Yeah, they could if all they wanted to know about was piece metals and how to do patchwork. Fortunately, there is some art out there that represents what Seminole looked like at the time. You look at the paintings, McKinney Hall, Mr. McKinney was the Secretary of the Interior. Indians were being sent to D.C. to impress him with the white man and see his big buildings and see his strength. And so while they were there, McKinney had artists paint their pictures. Then later he had those pictures change into engravings. Well, people studied the engravings and they could see ruffle on the shoulders of their outfits. So they said, well, we need to add ruffle to the top of the sleeve. No. Those ruffles were the top edge of a triangular cape in the back. But none of Mr. McKinney's paintings or engravings ever showed the back. So you didn't know they were a cape until you went looking to find out exactly what they were wearing instead of just going by pictures. Tell us about the scouts angle. So scouts gave me a, a survey paper that a museum gave them. I got interested because he also included references. So I started going from reference to reference. At that time, I held Judge Springboard Diving in Central Florida, and the statewide meet was always in Gainesville. So I go up to the meet with other people to watch the state meet, and I go to the library. Now, at that time, they had saved a lot of periodicals in book form. So say I'd seen a reference to a magazine from the 1940s. I could look up that magazine and make hard copy Xeroxes, and you can't do that now because they understand the interest of economy, they've gone and put all that stuff on microfilm. Have you ever tried to make a good, clean copy off of a microfilm? I have Xerox hard copies from the original publication of a lot of stuff. You look at the river. It took me several trips. One thing I photocopied to wonder why was a doctoral essay on the phonology of the Miccosukee language. I later learned that nobody is interested in the phonology of the Miccosukee language. Was your overall aim to ensure that the Seminole clothing was uniform when worn and displayed at living history events? Some may see this as a way to make Seminole clothing uniform. 
you're a bebop lady from the 1940s. What are you going to wear? You're going to wear shoes. You're going to wear a dress. You're going to wear a blouse. And maybe you tie a ribbon in your hair. Is your dress going to be like everybody else's? Is your blouse going to be like everybody else's? No. It's all going to be cotton. You're going to use different colors of cloth. Although the pattern is going to be the same, you're going to use that pattern in different ways to be your individuality. Are you going to have one ruffle on your dress? Two ruffles? No ruffles? Is your ruffle going to be the same color as a dress? Is it going to be a different pattern on the basic pattern of the dress? There's things that they might all choose to wear. Turns out that the beads Osceola has in Catlin's painting can easily be reproduced at a powwow in about 15 minutes just going around to the vendors with about $15. Is everybody going to wear Osceola's beads? Well, probably. But does that mean everybody's locked into wearing Osceola's beads? No. The beads they wore were called cobalts. They were all 8 millimeter. And we know from reading that some of them greatly like blue. And you look at the one picture we have of a Seminole woman, and sure enough, she's wearing dark blue beads. But you can buy dark blue cobalt beads. Are you going to buy orange ones, too, or green ones, or yellow ones? Well, maybe not, because you don't think the Seminoles wore those, because they preferred the red ones and the green ones. You can get cobalts. Ever heard of a uh, treaty oak trading post? They sell beads. They sell aurora borealis beads, but they sell the same aurora borealis beads in the same size and same shape, but without the borealis part. They're just plain colored beads. And those are very close duplicates to Russian cobalt. The uh, glass beads tree oak sells are 16 cents a piece. A Russian cobalt can cost you anything from 4 to $5 a piece. So are you going to say, well, if I wear Russian cobalt, it's because everybody has the money wears Russian cobalt? I'm going to wear orange ones instead because nobody wears orange ones. Well, there's a reason why nobody wears orange ones, because the Seminoles didn't wear orange ones. Some reenactors pierce their nose because they've read someplace that some Seminoles pierce their nose. I don't because it looks like I've got metal snot, but I'll uh, wear ear bobs. I won't pierce my ears. I'll wear ear bobs, and somebody with a real Seminole outfit will wear teardrop-shaped ear bobs. Does that mean that everybody's wearing the same uniform? I don't think so. He's got a red long shirt. He's got a blue long shirt. He's got a green long shirt with a violet paisley pattern. There's plenty of room for individuality. So let's think of a New York businessman. What does every New York businessman wear? Pants. What does he wear? A button shirt. What does he wear? A necktie. What does he wear? A jacket of some kind. What does he wear? A vest. Now, in New York, they all wear the same pants. You have to wear the same pants. Well, if you're wearing Seminole buckskin leggings, buckskin leggings come in only two or three colors, natural buckskin, or you can dye the buckskin kind of a burgundy color by using a tree bark. So if you're going to wear Seminole leggings, are you going to wear the orange ones or the green ones? No, because they didn't exist. But you can decide if you want to wear the plain buckskin or if you want to go to the trouble to dye your buckskins. Seminole leggings had what I call a fringe apron, garter apron. The garter that went around had a fringe on it. That fringe could be, going from the pictures, an inch long or four inches long. How long is your fringe going to be? Is it going to be the same one inch everybody else has? Or are you going to go to the trouble to make four inch long like fringe, like I have? The long shirt is called that way because it has an opening all the way down the front of the shirt the long ways. What color is it going to be? What color is the edging going to be? Are you going to put a ruffle on it? What color is the ruffle going to be? How many ruffles are you going to put on it? Are you going to put on a cape? There's six or eight different shapes of cape to put on the back. Which shape are you going to put in? Now, because you have a long shirt with a cape, does that mean you're like everybody? When you go to church Sunday morning, does that mean your necktie is like everybody else's? Or your winter jacket is the same color as everybody else's? No. It's the same basic parts, but there's room for personal taste and, and what you use to assemble your basic part. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous. You remember the uh, gold chains from 20 or 30 years ago? Who wore a gold chain? Somebody who could afford to wear a gold chain. Did that mean that he was head of the neighborhood? Did that mean that he was uh, ran with the mob? Did that mean that he uh, was a shaman of some kind? No. The people who wore gold chains in iClub for people. Mr. T, he wore gold chains because he liked wearing gold chains. The same thing with the gorgeous. You wore a gorget because you had the money to wear a gorget. 
Have you read the money or the gorget? The chiefs. That's why the ordinary run-of-the-mill town might not have a gorget, or if we had one, you have a small one. Who's aware of the gorgeous in the pictures? The people important enough to have pictures made of them. Now, if you wore a gorget, are you the same as everybody else wore a gorget? Oh, no. What size is a gorget? Are you wearing one, two, or three gorgets? Are they all the same size, or are they graduated in size? Even something like the gorget is not cookie-cutter the same. Now, you look at gorgets of the Great Lakes or from New England, they're going to be engraved. Some of the gorgets are all plain, plain, plain. There's no engraving on them. Does that mean they're all boringly the same? No, not at all, because they're individually made. You know the Indian phrase, gifted? I was once gifted a pair of ear bobs made by a silversmith that exactly duplicates a seminal ear bob that's in the uh, Alabama State Archives. We're not going to tell people, hey, you need to find yourself a silversmith to make you a historically accurate reproduction. We gave them a basic teardrop shape that you could make in 15 minutes at a powwow with basic shapes that you can get. We wanted to make it within the range of the average reenactor and the average Boy Scout. Uh, reminds me of a story. First of all, do you know what the Order of the Arrow is? It's like an honorary for scouting. And they have special events at camp once in a while. They will go to camp and they'll do word projects or they'll play games. One time the lodge out of Tampa told their youth, if you'll bring an extra 13 or $14 to the next OA event at camp, you'll go home with your own plane shirt. So they brought the money and they had pre-selected cloth there. You could pick the cloth you wanted and pay for it. And then they gave you a pattern to tell you what pieces to cut the cloth into. And then while you were doing your thing on Saturday, they had three or four Del Cero sewing machines to sew those pieces together. So yes, you could go home with a plain shirt if you wanted. I thought that was very cool. And they had half a dozen different cloth patterns, polka dot, stripes, colors, different colors. The boys went home with different plain shirts, all cut from the same pattern, all put, wore the same when they put them on, but no, they were not uniform. All right, Rick, state it plainly. Why is this book most useful? So you don't have to go to museums, so you don't have to go to research, so you don't have to go to Gainesville and look for publications from the 40s. Couldn't you consult journal articles? What journal? The nearest thing that has done articles on some of the clothing has been a Whispering Winds, a magazine out of Texas that caters to Native American hobbyists. Pete Thompson wrote several articles for them in the last 10 years. Outside of that, I found directions for making Samuel moccasins in a book from the 1930s, a boys' book that tells how to do boys' crafts. And when it was Samuel moccasins, Sturvin's article gave you a rough idea of the pieces that went together to make a long shirt, but there was no description on how to assemble it. I'll give you an example. You know that a Samuel long shirt has a triangular cape in the back, right? You would suppose that cape is attached to the shoulders by sewing it continuously from left to right across the shoulders. Wrong. When I looked at the 1910 examples in New York, I learned that the cape was attached at both ends and right at the neck, but there was a gap in between. Why did they leave that gap? I don't know, but it was there in every single case. What did oral history tell you about what an English workman wore in the 1840s? No idea. And neither do Seminoles. Remember, their culture was bankrupt. They were shoved into the Everglades to the subsistence existence. They can tell you what they had to eat last month. They can't tell you what their great-great-great-grandfather wore when he was hiding out in the Everglades, especially if they were buried in it. I collected Seminole postcards, and a couple of the weirdest postcards I have are postcards of Seminole burials. They were not buried underground. They were buried at ground level with like a little construction on top of them. How have Seminole Wars historians used the kit that you outline in your book? It's been my pleasure in the last 30, 40 years when I go to a reenactment, how what I see at reenactments has improved tremendously. I used to go to a reenactment and see a Seminole wearing, you know what nylon chiffon is? I'd see a Seminole wearing a nylon chiffon scarf. I'd see him wearing Apache boots. Apache boots is very 20th century. Nylon didn't exist until the 1930s. And I saw him wearing a bone choker. Well, that's very popular in the plains. But what's a bone choker doing in Florida? And I tactfully asked, uh, well, how is it you're wearing that piece? Oh, they could have got it in trade. 
Okay, now do me a favor. Picture a Scottish Highlander. He's wearing lederhosen under his kilt. He's wearing a French beret. Well, how did you happen to get the French beret, Mr. Highlander? Oh, he could have got it in trade. Is that a reasonable excuse, or is that any excuse at all? I've seen similar moccasins that were horribly sloppy, but at least they're not Apache boots. I've seen Seminoles in very handsome outfits without a single cloth bandana at all. Seminoles wore bandanas. They wore two, three, four, five, six. And the Seminoles wearing a plain shirt, what does he not have that you and I have right now? Pockets. Their neck bandanas is where they put their flint or their lucky piece or their extra money. And when I see reenactors not wearing a cloth bandana, what would be the cheapest part of their outfit? A cloth bandana. The only mentioned in passing in the workbook, because I thought it was obvious that people would jump on the cheapest, most economical part of any outfit. As has happened, some areas of our book are superseded by better knowledge. That would be Pete's articles that have appeared in Whispering Wind, because Pete sat down and gave you excruciatingly accurate details. A typical complaint of the workbook is, well, I gave this to my girlfriend or my wife or my mother, and she says, where's the pattern? I can't make it without a pattern. There's no pattern. Well, you're supposed to make it the way the Seminoles did, with a rip and tear. You'd be awful authentic if you did. (laughs) Tell us more about that Seminole patchwork. You can always tell a white man made jacket because they made some very simple omissions. The jackets can be beautiful, they can be exquisitely made, but they left things out. Next time you have time to look at a Seminole jacket, Look at the patchwork, which every book tells you how to make. Now look on either side of the patchwork. I bet you'll find a strip of cloth on either side, and those two strips of cloth are going to be in the same color. I call them bracketing bands. More so, those strips are going to be very narrow. Outside those strips, you may find slightly wider strips. Again, the same color. The slightly wider strips may even have rickrack on them. Not the inner narrow strips, but the outer ones that are a little wider. More bracketing bands. Go online, go look up some old jacket. You can go to the Smithsonian, look at some, and look at the patchwork and see if there aren't bracketing bands on either side of the patchwork. Now, later on, when the Seminoles got lazy and they realized that the tourists would buy jackets with only two bands instead of three, they replaced the third band with just some bands of colored cloth. It's just as colorful, isn't it, even though it isn't patchwork. All three bands would normally be different until you get to the late 80s. Then the top and bottom bands might be the same patchwork pattern. Okay, silly tourists don't know any better. We can sell them that. And then I got to where all three patchwork bands might be the same patchwork. Well, that saves a lot of time and trouble, doesn't it? And then lately, Seminole Jackets have had violent backgrounds, camo backgrounds. That's what bored Seminoles do. Background to some real seminal jackets was always a solid cloth. Lime green if you want, chartreuse if you want, but it's a solid color. The patchwork, something else white people do is if they have a very large person, they make the patchwork large. Look at your hand. Look at the width of your hand from your little finger to your thumb. I've seen patchwork that big on a jacket made for a large person. Take away your little finger and your thumb. What's left? That, sir, is a large Seminole patchwork pattern. Take away, go down to just two fingers. I have Seminole jackets with patchwork no wider than two fingers. If the patchwork pattern is no wider than three fingers, how do they accommodate a large person? With the bracketing bands. I make the bracketing bands a little bit wider. And then the background color, the generic background color, they'll make that wide enough to make a jacket big enough for a large person. Make sense? How long does your patchwork have to be if you decide to make your own seminal jacket? Six feet. Typically, a seminal woman would wake up and say, what am I in the mood to do today? Oh, I'm in the mood to do seminal patchwork. So she'll spend the day just making a long string of patchwork. And when she's done it, she's trimmed it off, she'll put it in a basket. On another day, she'll wake up and say, what am I in the mood today? Oh, I'm in the mood to make a jacket. She'll go to her basket of seminal patchwork and pick out three bands that she wants to work with. Before I knew better, I made myself a seminal jacket. It took me about a week. I made mistakes. I'm darn proud of it, but I can see how it's not a lot hard to do. Seminal girls were sewing by the time they were 12 or 13. 
Now, sometimes you'll see jackets with very, very tiny patchwork, two fingers or less. Some of those have a name for that. They call that postage stamp patchwork. I've seen jackets where a piece of cloth in it is a quarter of an inch across. Well, they never had to handle a piece that was only a quarter by a quarter. That piece is a part of another civil strip, which they put together with other pieces to make the small patchwork pattern that's in the jacket. There are five banded Seminole jackets. You see them worn by people who are chairman of the tribe. I took one to Antiques Roadshow. They didn't know what they were looking at. I figure a five banded for these days, $900. A three banded jacket where the bands are different patchwork. It's not an item of clothing anymore. It's an artifact. And they're going on eBay for 350 to $400. They wear well. You can put it in the washing machine on general cycle. I know guys that have jackets that are 40 years old and are so proud to wear them. A long time ago, I mean like 30, 35 years ago, I went down to the trail with a buddy, and he wanted to buy a some old jacket. And his problem was he's only five foot seven. So we went, we looked and looked and looked. We looked at what was on the rack, nothing fitting. The young lady who could tell we were sincere about buying said, well, let me go look in the back. So she went in the back, brought some out, and by golly, she brought out a four-banded jacket and a mustard color. And I said, well, Todd, this color is kind of unusual for Seminole. He says, I don't care. It fits me perfect. Yes, I brought the money to pay for it. He bought it, and he's darn proud of it. I can now never, ever replace it. Oh, one more thing. That's why when I see Seminole patchwork, in an 1840s outfit, I'll say, well, okay, they're doing it in the right spirit. In the 1840s, Seminoles were doing applique, not patchwork. It goes to the workbook, and it describes how applique happened. And you've seen the evolution or adaptation over time for Seminole uniforms, Seminole clothing, as far back as the Dade battle reenactments of the 1980s? I was there in 85 for the anniversary of Dade. I went to a powwow, and I saw some Creek types, not necessarily Seminole, Creek types. And what they were wearing looked very strange. The long shirt has a triangular cape on the back, right? And you know that cape has a ruffled edge. Here, I saw people wearing a plain shirt, and they had ruffles attached in a triangle on the back of their plain shirts. Some of those privately call those cape shirts. They didn't know any better. They knew there was a ruffle. They didn't know why it was there. They knew nothing about it. So a young man in his 20s looks at the workbook and it looked really interesting to him. So I said, can I borrow this for a while? I said, yeah, sure. He came back about 20 minutes and says, well, thanks for letting me look at it. Our wise woman says it's full of mistakes. All right, stop and think. What does the workbook have in it? Photographs or drawings? What does the workbook have in it? References? Hard places where you can go and see the stuff or know about the stuff? I said, well, golly gee, how are you told it's full of errors? Our wise woman looked at it and said it was full of errors. I said, really? Point her out to me. I pointed out an overweight, middle-aged woman who was obviously very honored by her group. A friend of mine uh, had an experience where he gently suggested to somebody that they had an inaccuracy in their outfit. He said, well, where did you learn to do that? Oh, well, great Aunt Toomey, who was a niece of Osceola, said that's how it was done. And when my friend suggested that great Aunt Toomey's memory might be faulty, the guy told him, why are you ripping great Aunt Toomey apart? She's a nice lady. Why are you telling her why she's a nice old lady? Why are you being so mean to her? The fact that great Aunt Toomey might have a faulty memory had nothing to do with that. So when you're talking to people about their outfit, that they've made from love, that they've made from commitment, that they've made because they honestly believe they have the right spirit. You got to be careful how you walk on that thin ice. There's a workbook on how to do authentic Cherokee outfits. He says, if you want to make a bone breastplate, all you got to do is go get Venetian blind tubes. Works as good as the real thing. Yeah? I've had somebody tell me, well, I'm part Native American, and if I do it, it was authentic because I'm doing it. All right. So, like I said, what I've seen today has improved greatly. So, Rick, what are you most proud about about this book? You said, what am I most proud of about this book? What I'm most proud about is that people who are asking questions 
had a place where they could get answers to those questions. What were some things you had to adapt based on new information? We had to expand the size of the grommet. That's a triangular piece of cloth that's in the armpit. And a friend did some research and found a first-person letter somebody had written. They were in St. Augustine before the Seminole Wars, and they described seeing the Seminoles going down the streets in their face paint. And until then, I kind of assumed that Seminoles never wore face paint except in serious situations like ceremonial, the green corn dance, or when they went to war. Well, this first person saw him walking down the street wearing face paint. Obviously, that's an error I have to correct. And that's it. I'm pretty much satisfied with everything else. Once it made, there was discussion on, well, you got on a turban. Do you wear your ostrich feather in the front of the turban or the side of the turban in the back of the turban? Well, only chiefs could wear it in a certain spot of the turban. I have never run across that any place. That doesn't tend to be backed up by the portraits painted of someone else. But if you're happy to think and believe that and want to do that, now, okay, you're not harming anybody. If you're going to wear a nylon chiffon neckcloth and feel really spiffy, okay, you're not hurting anybody, you're not accurate. At one, you know, there's a small reservation in Tampa. At one time, they had a small strip of beadwork there, and the beadwork read Leonard Skinner. L-Y-N-Y-R-D, S-K-Y-R-D. So he bought it, and he wore that over his turban, and he was happy that he was wearing a genuine Seminole artifact. Leonard Skinner was a rock group, uh, Seminole Authentic. They made it, Seminole stitches on a pillowcase. Does that make the pillowcase a Seminole artifact? Yes, it does. Does it make it appropriate for an event that's supposed to take place in 1840? Well, maybe not. That's, it's nice because the book isn't really available for general sale anymore. They sold it for a while. I passed around order sheets for a while, but there hasn't been much demand for it lately. So that's okay. If it's so regenerating, that's fine. And I sent a copy of the book to a website in New York State. I was really impressed by how complete the website was on Native American items in a game, in a cooking. To my surprise, the lady added the whole workbook to her website, www.nativetech, all one word, N-A-T-I-V-E-T-E-C-H, dot org. The problem is that some of the picture links have broken down, but it's there and it's free. I understand the whole website, Native Tech, is funded by the Native American tribes in New York State. Your interest in seminal clothing is just one facet of your overall interest in things seminal. Tell us about that. I collect Native American cookbooks. And sometimes at scouting functions, we have made soft key and given away free samples. Or we have a workshop in making pumpkin bread, which is kind of cool, in which you can tell Boy Scouts, no, you don't make a mess by dabbing at it with your fingertips you got to get your hands in there and really mush it up. You tell them they're supposed to make a mess. That's fine. What else? Did you know there was a splinter group of Seminoles that got tired of living in Oklahoma and went to Mexico? At one time, they did a survey of the boundary between Mexico and the United States. It was a two-volume survey. It had a few color plates in it, and one of the color plates is a Seminole Indian. When the color plates came up on eBay... And I bought it. It's hanging in the hall. Of course, behind UV glass. He's dressed in all the standard seminal outfits, except he's also wearing a vest. Oh, nice to have that picture. Oh, there's something else. I have offered all of my items to the Florida State University Department of Anthropology. I had occasion to go up to Tallahassee for a week earlier this year. And I took everything. I said, tell me what you want to get. So they set aside the afternoon. And by golly, they took all the afternoon to go through it. And they said, well, we'll take it all. Uh, okay. As it happened, they had just moved into what had been the former geology building. And there's a whole floor filled with empty display cases. So I imagine that would happen. Never heard of Derry Wood? They have a set of seminal moccasins made by Derry Wood, who himself learned from Billy Bowlegs III. And they have a few other seminal sample pieces. They're going to get a whole bunch of stuff from me because I'm not going to try to sell it. Besides that, I have a couple boxes of references and resources. 
I have some odd things. I have some Choctaw sashes. I have some Choctaw stick toss sticks. I have a real pair of Seminole moccasins. You're not familiar with Orlando, but there used to be a resort thing downtown, and they wanted to Church Street Station. So for some reason, they bought a Native American collection out of Atlanta. It had beaded gloves from the prairie. It had beaded bandolier bags. And of all things, they had Seminole moccasins. I mean, these things are so real, they had cockroach egg cases on them. Bought the pair for $75. I showed them to the curator in Gainesville. She said, it's a good thing you saw them first. They're in a box in the closet. Someday the Department of Anthropology will get them. FSU, the moccasins that Derry Wood had made. He had made a few other things for them. So I knew they had an interest. I started with the University of Central Florida, which is in Orlando where I am. So I contacted them and they said, well, we really don't have space for that kind of thing. Why don't you contact the theater department? Yeah, like I'm really going to turn artifacts over to the theater department to use for costuming. When I was there, I happened to have, again from eBay, the newspapers from the 1850s that originally printed some engravings of Seminoles and what they look like. And I had that stored here for years. I took it with me, and on impulse, I gave it to them. I figured that they should have it stored. Man, I see how it's stored between my stereo and, and the wall. Now, Rick, you mentioned the McKinney Hall pictures, and now you've got an angle to it. Now, you know what the McKinney Hall pictures are. My grandmother gave me some legacy, so I started buying the McKinney Hall pictures. I have all but one, and that one would have cost me $17,000. I said, well, I don't need that one that bad. I had accumulated all of them except Osceola. Osceola appeared on eBay. Oh, jeez. What's it going to go for? The others they've gone for variously from 600 to $900, but they were in Osceola. So I put in a bid of about $1,600, and I started thinking, man, I better be sure. So I went back and put in a much higher bid of over $2,000. Do you know what a sniper is? Somebody came in and tried sniping me. He put in a bid of $1,800. Nope, he didn't get it. Oops. I already had a much higher bid waiting, and Osceola sure looks nice in my hallway, away from direct sunlight, matted with acid-free paper behind UV glass. I might have to sell that instead of giving that to FSU. I have that one and five or six others. Many more Wilson wrote a book about the Seminoles of Florida. What's notable for that? The Indians of Florida? Yeah, you used to give by that at used bookstores for $15. You know, it's got some, you know, vocabulary at the end. Some of the uh, Florida OA lodges got their names out of the back of Mindy War Wilson. And what boggles my mind about that book, the photographs are of the Seminole settlement near Kissimmee. There's no settlement near Kissimmee these days or any sign of one. The fact that there was once one kind of makes me wonder. Rick, earlier you said that you drove up the East Coast visiting museums. What's something remarkable that you found? Oh, let me tell you one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in a museum. There used to be a roadside museum between Orlando and Kissimmee, and I went there and looked at it. I saw a youth, a boy's side Seminole jacket with four bands, so you can imagine how small the patchwork was, nailed to the wall. Ah, the museum's gone just as well. Oh, there was the Seminoles on one side of the settlement that's close to where I live, is Kissimmee. Now the next closest one is Tampa. And something remarkable happened for the Seminole to get a reservation in Tampa. Okay, so they're getting ready to put in a new building in downtown Tampa. They find human bones. Bottle collectors go in looking for bottles. They find human bones. They contacted the police. The police figured out that it was an old Indian graveyard. So they contacted the state of Florida which hired some professional archaeologists to go in and excavated it. It's called the Quad Block site, and the report on that site is like an inch thick. Well, a Seminole graveyard is going to be Seminole land, right? So you don't proceed to put the skyscraper on top of it. So they went to the tribe, and the tribe said, you know, we have some property out on the edge of town. Tell you what, we'll swap you. We'll give you that property, and that'll be tribal land just as sure as any reservation if you'll let us have your burial ground after all the bones have been removed, and you can put the bones back in the ground at the property. 
some else said, okay, we'll do that. Well, the Seminoles moved out there. First, they had a flea market out there, and they had a small cultural center, which is kind of interesting. At one time, they hired a big husky Cuban boy to wrestle the alligators. A lot of the beads that they excavated from the quad block site were put on display there. By the way, all those beads have, of course, vanished. Now the Seminoles, and like other Indian tribes, funded the casino. The casino down there, that's on Indian property. The casino proceeds, that's on Indian money. They didn't give it up. They're hanging on to it, making the big bucks. It used to be when you drove that way, there'd be a water tower for the Seminole, and the water tower would have a big arrow going through it. When they got the property in uh, East Tampa, they went to a big cypress and said, we need one or two families to go reside there. And the you know, family did. And Rick, you have something from a legendary Seminole seamstress. I have a Seminole long shirt made by Ruby Tiger Osceola when she was in her 80s. She still hadn't learned English. Well, she died at 100 and something, so that's not an item of clothing anymore. That's now an artifact. Well, it's not how does she do it. It's how does she do it that was the same as what they were doing 100 years ago. And that's amazing. Her sleeves are really short. Her sleeves only come like down to the elbow. Her cape is attached all the way across the top. But other than that, a little patchwork, it's the real deal. She made two, a red one and a black one. And I bought the red one, and she gave the black one to her granddaughters. And what did you learn from visiting sites? What about visiting sites? There's nothing in Florida with pre-1890, except what I told you about Gainesville. Fort Pierce has a pocket museum that has some stuff collected in the 1890s. They have a quiver made from alligator. They have a woman wearing an 1890s dress. They have an 18, a lot of 1890s stuff. Servants, of course. Uh, it covered everything. It was my starting point. With all this background, what was the hardest thing that you made, and why? I made probably the only existent pair of fringe garter apron with four inch fringe. Cause I cut that buckskin with a pair of scissors and boy did my hand get worn out cutting that buckskin fringe. Once I went down the, uh, the Town Henry Trail and they were selling beaded belts. I bought two, took one, added tassel cords, which took a while to make. Hit a woman with tassel cords. A friend asked if he could borrow my outfit to go take the scout camp every Wednesday night. Yeah, sure. So he came home one Wednesday, and it was raining. So he left it in the back seat of the car because he didn't want to go through the rain. That was the night somebody broke into his car to try and steal a stereo, which they never could get out of the car. But they stole the handy suitcase that was in the back seat. Fortunately, it was covered by insurance. Fortunately, Ruby Tiger Osceola's long shirt was wet, so it was loose in the back shirt. They didn't take that. Now, fortunately, my leggings were wet, so they were loose in the back seat, too. But that's my oh dear story. Another story. I went to a powwow, and a woman was selling items she would made out of German silver. I thought, wow, these are really nice. Why don't you make some wristbands? She said, well, what do those look like? So I uh, sent her pictures of them. A year later, I went to the same powwow, and she had a basket full of wristbands. I said, oh, I need to buy a pair. They were 25 a pair. She said, wait a minute, are you the person that told me how to make them? I said, yeah. She said, here, take a pair. I appreciate you sharing with me. So I had some really nice German silver wristbands. Last story, the big rendezvous that's in January over towards Tampa. Yes, of course, uh, Alafia. Yes, I went to that. I'm walking around, and I saw a guy had on display a museum-quality bandolier bag. I said, will you take a credit card? He said, yes. So that's my prized possession. Don't ask me how much I paid for it. It brought me happiness. You know, a bandolier bag is worth more than the whole rest of the outfit put together. Man, you know, when you try making a bandolier bag, it takes two needles. It was obviously a copy of a museum's example that I know of. If it was just something made, I might not have done it, but I, I recognized it. That was a time when the scouts in Naples were really into it. They would send a school bus full of scouts to date. It takes a local adult to be interested and share his enthusiasm with the youth. You need the adult. Well, when you go to do date, what kind of footwear do you wear? Or do you play a soldier? Okay. I get an outfit, but I do not have a gun. So 
so I babysit the cats high. There was a problem. Remember I told you we went around to every museum that had Southeastern stuff? I have two binders full of photographs of Seminole items. Rick Obermeyer, we'll leave it there. Thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. All right, thanks for having me. This podcast is copyright 2022, the Seminole Wars Foundation, all rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminolewars.podbean.com or seminolewars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.